So our first speaker is Hadi. You have seen his name uh, in all the lectures, but you haven't seen him. <laughs> so he's Hadi. Um, he was a former PhD student and postdoc in um, the former communication department of KTH. Now it's called Information Science and Engineering. Uh, so he got his PhD with Nicholas Koglund, and afterward he was a postdoc jointly with ISE and our department uh, NSE at KTH, and now he's an assistant professor at uh, Telecom Paris State. So uh, thank you for coming mm -hmm. here. Okay, thank you for the invitation. Thank sure. you, thank you. So, mm -hmm. um, so the, the, the idea is going to be about uh, machine learning over network workshop, large scale training for deep neural network. You have seen some of this stuff in, um, in the last lecture, uh, but then here, Hadi will delve into those topics a bit more um, to see uh, how we can train a deep neural network whenever we do have a large scale, either in size, in the data size or in the network size. So again, thank you for the invitation. Uh, so somehow, as I, I was also involved with this course, but it was nice to to be to be able to to get back here and talk about uh, this topic. So as uh, as Hossein mentioned, so this is a nice continuation of what you guys have seen before. So basically, we will, this will try to build on some of the things that you saw on stochastic gradient and large scale training. But here we have tried to apply them to training a deep neural network. So basically, so the talk will probably, I'll try to outline, so depending on how much time we have, I will try to outline some challenges for the DNN optimization problem, deep neural networks. Um, basically, I'll talk a bit about the loss function, some of the complexities, how does the surface look like. I will also try to, uh, so, and then the bulk of the talk, it will be. It will consist of some uh, of some of these, like state of the art large scale training methods, such as Adam Adagrad, if you're familiar with that. Uh, and then finally, I will try to highlight a bit uh, the importance of regularization uh, in deep neural networks, and then talk about some ways to to try to mitigate overfitting. And finally, if we have some time, I will also say a couple of words on some tricks of the trade. This is a this is a this is a code that I borrowed from. Uh, from Benjo. So basically, they try to refer at strict as the tail as like batch normalization, things where you try to uh, improve some heuristics that try to improve the training performance. So, uh, okay, so I'll start with, with, with the first part. So over here, I'll try to, to say a few things about some challenges, highlight some challenges in when we, thought, when we think about optimizing the loss function. So basically, how does the loss function look like some, some of these inherent characteristics? So let's start with this, uh, the deep neural network written in this fully parametric form. So as I was saying, this fully parametric form, basically here in this one, you try to write the loss function as a sum over all the samples, right? So basically it's, it's this argument over f of w, where actually, you, you, where actually you take the sum over, you actually optimize over the set of all the parameters, w. And here w, is the set of all parameters in the neural network. So basically, it's a d by one vector, right? Where you bunch, where you, where you vectorize, where you stack all the network parameters. And in, in a neural network, this is a big parameter, right? So this is a big parameter space. So the size of d is gonna be quite large. And then some other, uh, some other definitions that I will use throughout this talk. So f is the regularized loss function, right? So here I'm include, I'm assuming that the loss function f has already the regularization. I will also assume that fi, it's separable, and then fi is the loss function for sample i, and i is the index of, uh, actually, sorry, i is an index from the set of training samples, n. Uh, right, and then finally I will also, uh, I will also assume, he actually not assume, so here I, we should also recall that this problem is non-complex when you're thinking about a deep neural network, obviously. Uh, some other notation that I will also use throughout this talk, so I'll denote the gradient of, by the gradient by gk, so this is the gradient of the function at iteration wk, when, when I evaluate it at point wk, and hk, the Hessian of f at iteration also wk, just some notation. Uh, so I will also denote by lambda i, so the eigenvalues of the Hessian, so the, the, the eigenvalues are from one to d. So this one has d eigenvalues, it's a d by d matrix. So, uh, so now that we have said something about the setup, let me move on to say something also, some, some of the, again, some of the inherent characteristics or problems, or actually not, not cha well, mostly challenges, I think this is the word. So, uh, so usually, if you recall well, when we talk about uh, training deep nets, 
so I think only, it's, it's obvious by now that only first order methods can work. You cannot use Hessians, you cannot use second order information because the complexity just like just blows up. So, and then again, when you think about first order methods, uh, so you can, exactly, so, so, so the, at, at best, when, when in the non-convex setting, at best you can hope that your, whatever algorithm you have will convert to a stationary point. And uh, if, uh, just, a, just a refresher, a stationary point, so, if, a stationary po so basically a point W is stationary if and only if the gradient is zero. Yeah. So in the convex setting, this is, a this is a sufficient and necessary condition, but in the non-convex setting, as you may recall, so actually this is a, a stationary point, so a point where the gradient is zero could be a maximum, could be a minimum, or could be a saddle point. And this is especially problematic when we think about uh, when we think about the loss function of deep neural networks, because actually it's it's well known that this loss function has way too many saddle points. So here uh, we want to so here we want to we want to discuss like a very simple argument to say to basically try to to say that most of the saddle most of the saddle points are uh, sorry most of the stationary points are saddle points. So basically, so basically. Uh, local, local minimum and local maximum are actually do not happen when you think about the loss function. Most of the points where the gradient is zero look like that. So this is, and here actually you can construct a simple argument from, uh, that comes from random matrix theory and then it goes as follows. So basically can, can we compare the number of saddle points versus the number of local minima? And yes, actually, so we can construct a simple logical argument. So if you want, think about the eigenvalues of H as, uh, as Bernoulli distributed uh, variable. So basically, the eigenvalue lambda i, so the i eigenvalue is positive with probability p. And then this is independent of all the other eigenvalues, right? So in that case, uh, so to, have to get local minima, you need all the eigenvalues to be positive. So basically, this happens, the probability of this, is hap the probability of this happening is p to the power d, where p is a small number and d is a huge, p, recall that d, is the number of parameters in the deep neural network. So this, this probability goes to zero exponentially, right? So, so the, the, the number, of the, the, the probability of local minima is exponentially less than the probability of uh, saddle points. So they are not likely to occur, local minima. Uh, so basically this is just to say that uh, almost all the stationary points are saddle points. And this also, I mean, this result is also a bit validated uh, by empirical results and also uh, uh, but also from, from an empirical point of view, actually there's lots and lots of works to suggest that most of these local minima are good enough in terms of not, not training error, but generalization error. Okay, uh, so far so good. Okay, so uh, another, uh, another challenge also when we think about the loss function is the issue of ill conditioning, which I think Hossein hinted to in the last one. But here I'll try to focus this issue on, uh, on, the, on, on the issue of ill conditioning when you're training a deep net for deep learning. So, uh, so again, recall that, uh, recall that the, Ill the, the ill conditioning is basically one way to think about it intuitively is so the curvature of the function is not even across all the dimensions. Also another way to think about it is that the eigenvalues of the Hessian are not evenly distributed. You have small eigenvalues and large eigenvalues, such as what I've tried to illustrate here. Uh, so basically as a result, when you, when, when you do that, uh, so when you take some gradient steps actually, so you may, you may end up increasing the cost uh, due, to that, due to that problem and the fact that the function is non-convex. Uh, so one way, one way to, to sort of like compensate, to compensate this one is to think about uh, picking the step size. You can actually pick the step size in such a way to, to avoid these problems. Uh, so basically uh, the optimal, we can think about picking the optimal step size and optimal in the sense of the step size that like induces the maximum decay. We can do that, we can get a closed form, but then that closed form, so the optimal step size, depends on the Hessian and the gradient, which is not available. You don't wanna use the Hessian basically. It's, it's too expensive to get that. So basically another way to think about that, to solve that problem, is to think also about preconditioning. And then again, intuitively with, with preconditioning, so with gradient methods, right? So you, you have an update, your update. Uh, so you update your parameters with alpha, with the parameter alpha. Uh, whereas with preconditioning, what you try to do is you try to, uh, you try to actually scale each, each, 
each element in that, uh, in that direction in which you move by a different value. So not a, not a single scalar. So this is intuitively what you're trying to do with preconditioning. And this is another way to, to, solve, to actually address this ill-conditioning problem, which is basically just Actually, it's illustrated over here, right? So here, this is, this is an ill-conditioned ill conditioned way. So basically here, the eigenvalues are different. So the eigenvalues of the session matrix are, uh, are different. Here, actually, ideally, this is the ideal scenario. So basically, in this ideal scenario, it's, uh, the eigenvalues are exactly the same. So this is a perfect setting for gradient descent and first order method. This is actually a bit tricky because then, as you can see, the iterations will oscillate. So you'll take a lot of time before you converge. Right, okay, uh, so just, just to say a few things here. Again, poor conditioning is also another issue where you basically, it, it's due to the fact that, again, you cannot pick this step size optimally because you don't have access to the Hessian. So what happens is that you, pay, you basically pick the step size in advance, right, independently of the Hessian and the gradient. And as a result, you have something where your oscillations, where your, where your cost functions oscillate. So basically, the, uh, the, the function, the, when you look at the function evaluation, it's not monotonic. This is another problem. It's also due to the fact that you're not, you don't have access, you're not using the Hessian, the second order information, and as well to the fact that the loss function is non-convex. Uh, right, so this, this, this is as far as the, uh, some, some highlighting some, some of the challenges. Uh, then I will move, if, if there are no questions or no, uh, no comments, then let me move on to talk about some methods. Yeah, so now that I've motivated some of the methods that have, uh, so, sorry, some of the challenges, I'll sp uh, the bulk of this talk is basically to, to talk about actually some of these large scale methods for training the deep neural networks. Right, so as I was saying, uh, so I'll start with like the basic ones, which is like SGD, which has been covered extensively, but I'll just like give a recap because I mean, this is the, this is like, the, the building block of most of these methods that, that have been used. So this is the core component. So basically recall that, uh, so, so what is the motivation for SGD? Basically you cannot, it's because of the, it's because of the fact that if you wanna compute a full gradient, you cannot, it's, it becomes too expensive. So this is the, this, that's the motivation for SGD. Uh, and the idea, the motivation, so, so what is the intuition behind it? It's basically, you take a, so you take a, instead of, you take a gradient step with respect to one sample. You compute the gradient of one sample and then you move along that direction. So for instance, if you wanna look at the pseudo, if you wanna look at the pseudo code, it looks like that. So you pick a, you pick a sample i, pick a sample i randomly from that training set. And then actually you, you, compute, you compute the stochastic gradient with respect to sample i, and then it, I have denoted it by g hat i k. So this is the stochastic gradient of sample i at iteration k. And then you actually, you update the weights along the direction of alpha k g i k. So basically w k plus one equals w k minus alpha k g hat i k. So basically, what you, what you end up doing is move along the direction of the stochastic gradient, and here alpha k is the step size. So alpha, you move along the direction of alpha k. Uh, right, so here I will, not, I, I, will, I will just like sweep under the rug the fact that uh, there are some ways to pick the step side, I'll say something more later. Right, so, uh, so this is, I mean, this is, so this is, the, this is the main intuition behind SGD. And then, so, so what is the advantage? Again, the advantage is that it's, it's, a, it's very low complexity. So here's the complexity in this, actually this is called plain van or, or vanilla SGD. So this is when you just like pick one sample. So this is the most classical version of SGD. So uh, yeah, so what is the advantage again? It's the complexity. So here the complexity is very low. So in this plain version, the complexity is in the order of one. Uh, however, the, obviously the problem is that when you're trying to estimate uh, the full gradient with the gradient of one sample, this is a very poor estimation. So the quality of that estimator is bad. So you, you, need, you may wanna find a way to improve that. So, and that's exactly the motivation for using mini batches. So mini batch SGD is basically exactly trying to solve that problem. So instead of, uh, so instead of like computing the gradient over one sample, you compute the gradient over a batch of samples. So basically you, uh, yeah. So you pick a batch of samples B, which is actually picked at random, uniformly at random from the set N, which is the set of indices for the training set. And then you to compute the stochastic gradient with respect to that batch. So basically it's the, it's, it's the, it's the sum of the indices over 
for the so so basically you, you you sum over the gradients of the samples which are in that batch in B. And then actually you you do a simple update weight update, which is basically W K plus one equals W K plus alpha K G I K right. And here actually G I K is your mini batch gradient, which is a better has a better estimation than the true gradient than the than the simple gradient yeah, than the sorry than the simple S G D than the simple stochastic gradient. Uh, so as I was saying, obviously this will improve the uh, the estimation of the of, of this is will improve the estimation quality of your SG, uh, and then also uh, so the interesting thing to note is that if you uh, if you set the batch size to to be one sample sample I singleton of sample sample I, then actually you get the plain SGD that we talked about, and then if you set the batch size to n the entire training set, then you get the full gradient. So basically, uh, so the good thing, the pros, the advantages of this mini batch SDD is that by playing the, with the batch size, you can actually trade off the, accur the accuracy of your gradient estimator versus the complexity. So this is the advantage of this one. Yeah. So you can actually decide depending on how much, how, on how much, uh, yeah, how much complexity you can afford, yeah, to increase the batch size up, up to a certain point. Okay. Uh, Again, also another, yet another layer of improvement that you may want to wish is like, uh, so can, can, if you're interested in like speeding up the, trying to speed up the training without having, without using uh, Hessian methods or second order methods, because in, 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 in deep learning, it's uh, the complexity just blows up. They are basically infeasible. So here you try, to, here the, what, 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 what you try, what you're trying to say is that, can I also speed up the convergence under which condition? And the condition is that I'm not gonna use any second order information. And then it turns out that you can do that with something that is called momentum methods or acceleration. So basically the idea again is like you wanna accelerate uh, the, the, the convergence of your stochastic gradient method. And uh, so basically the idea is you add something that is called momentum. So again, SGD, when you, want, when you wanna combine it with momentum basically works like this. So again, it's, you start with a, with, you pick a sample I uniformly from N, right? So this is, so far, this is what we have done before. You compute the stochastic gradient with respect to this sample. So G I K, sorry, G hat I K. So this is the stochastic gradient of sample I at iteration K. And then here you add on top of S G D, you add a momentum step. You compute a, an updated momentum. So basically, uh, so this updated momentum, right? So this is a, so T I K plus one equals eta T I K. So basically uh, what you try to do here, well actually, well actually eta is a positive number. It, it's a, it's an, it's a, sorry, it's a real number that is strictly less than one. So basically at each, at each iteration, your, you shrink the previous one. So this is the momentum term. So this is what you do with the momentum term. So each, uh, so each T I, so each, so it, so T I, so at, 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 at the current iteration, you shrink the previous one. This is how you update the momentum term. So this is this is what you have. So so this is how you update the momentum term. And finally, to to do the weight update. So basically, the weight update. Uh, so you you take a. So basically, it looks the same as SGD, the plane SGD. So WK plus one equals WK minus alpha K GIK. So this is forget forget about the last part. So this is the update that you have with SGD. And then here you just add subtract momentum term, which you computed before. And actually. You can check that actually this momentum term T i k plus one. So basically this is an exponentially decaying multiplier of all the previous gradients. So here actually each, so here you actually, you add, you, you're adding some gradients. You are actually adding the gradients to your updates, previous gradients, but with an exponentially decaying, uh, with, a, with an exponentially decaying weight. And so, uh, what, what, what is the intuition behind that? So what, what, are, you tr what are we trying to accomplish here? So basically, uh, if we wanna actually look, look at that here, uh, so if we wanna look at what's happening here, so basically when you add momentum, uh, you're trying to actually uh, smooth, smooth out the variations in, in the gradient. So basically this works best when you have these kind of like uh, uneven curvature, right? So basically when the contour lines are like ellipsoids or something like that. So basically in this setting, so this, this, sorry, this, this black curve, this black dots, so these are the gradient. And then the red one is what you have with momentum. So basically by, by adding this small momentum term, you're trying to, to dampen, to, to, to dampen the, 
the, the iteration. So basically, you try to, to you actually shorten the range of oscillations. So this way, you can you can converge faster. And and again, here remember that this will work well when you have an uneven curvature. So basically, when the eigenvalues of the Hessian are very different. So this is where you get a speed up when you compare that to to SGD. Uh, okay. Oh, yeah, sure. Sorry? Mm -hmm. uh, so so uh, you're talking about this this uh, eta exactly yeah so actually as long as as long as eta is strictly as long as you pick it less than one you have no problems with stability so you're talking about uh, whether this the sum just like blows up so this is this is what you're asking about So, so actually, you, you initialize it, and actually, each TI depends. Is it just a scaled version of the previous one? You just scale it. You just shrink it. Because yeah. So basically, uh, so let, so you can think about TI as a vector. Think about that vector. So you, you initialize it. So T1, you start with the first iteration. This is a vector, and then in the second iteration, it gets shrunk. So basically, you start with this one, and then it's this one, and then it's this one, because you are multiplying it by a constant that is strictly less than one. Okay, uh, right. So, uh, so as I was saying again, so this is so so this this momentum works well when you have this uneven curvature, which is basically what you have here. And then the idea is when you add this momentum term, you're actually smoothing out these oscillations that you get from using the gradient or the the, the pure SGD. So without without momentum. Right. Okay. Uh, so again, so far I've like said we've said nothing about the step size. And again here, like may, maybe. I'll make a few comments about how do we pick the step size. Uh, so basically, again, to say something about the step size. So basically, the step size is, is a very important parameter when you talk about uh, when you talk about first order methods, and it's, and namely in the case of so so basically the step size alpha k. So when we talk about it in the context of deep learning backpropagation, it's called also also called the learning rate. So these two terms are like used equivalently. So uh, so what is the idea? So what are some of the some of the constraints that we have to take into some of the design criteria. So as I was saying, so ideally, if you wanna pick the optimal step size, so if you had all, if you could afford all the complexity, you pick the step size, the optimal step size, and in the and what I mean by optimal is that the step size that gives you the maximum decay when you when you go from WK to WK plus one. And if you had all the freedom to choose that, actually it would depend on the Hessian and the gradient, but we are assuming here, actually not assuming. It's clear that you cannot afford because you cannot afford to compute the Hessian inverted and things like that. So we want to actually try to pick the step side in, in, a, in a smart way without having to use the Hessian. And the challenges that we want to solve actually is again try to see what happens when you have a smooth curvature. Sorry, when you have a smooth Hessian and when you have an uneven Hessian. And again, so uh, the the problem with this one is that. Ideally, you want to choose it based on the Hessian and the gradient, but in practice, you cannot do that. In practice, actually, you fix the step size. So basically, in deep learning, when we talk about backpropagation, you fix it. So you basically, some common choices is, it's basically like one over square root k, or one over k, or uh, some small constant. So basically, in backpropagation, this is what people do. But, so, so what, is the, what, is the, what is the problem with this choice? So basically, the problem is that if you have this ideal setting where the eigenvalues of the Hessian are the same in this very simple scenario. So here actually lambda one and lambda two are the eigenvalues of the Hessian. In that case, actually, so back propagation, gradient descent, actually you will converge very, very quickly, right? So you'll just go right straight away to the optimal point. Again, here, if you actually, if you're using just like plain gradient, actually you will have lots of oscillations as we saw before. So here actually, so this is, this is the problem when you use actually a step size, a fixed a priori independently of the gradient and things like that. Independently of the gradient and the Hessian, most, more specifically. Uh, right, and also uh, another, uh, yes, so basically this is just to motivate that actually basically we wanna adapt the step size in a smart way to kind of like avoid these problems. And at the same time, we don't want to use the Hessian. We don't want to use the some some sec, some second order information. And this give this is basically the motivation for 
sorry, for, for adaptive, uh, adaptive rate methods. And actually adaptive rate method, as the name indicate, is that you try to adapt the step size in a way with, so basically to make, to, to improve the convergence, to try to, I don't know, uh, to try to improve on the step sizes of gradient, of, of pure gradient and things like that. So I'll, I'll say more. So, but this was just a motivation. So basically, again, here, uh, the goal here, the motivation is that, I mean, yeah, we wanna, we wanna like sort of have a heuristic or a rule at least. Actually, most of these things that we will talk about, actually, they're, they're heuristics. So it's, there is no uh, mathematical guarantees, little mathematical guarantees. So, uh, so the first one that I wanted to talk about is, uh, is something that is called adaptive gradient, adagrad, or simply adagrad. So also this is another method where you try to also uh, try to get some, uh, take into account some, some, some of the a priori information that you have on, the, on, the loss, on, on your function, on the, on the shape of the loss function. So basically, what is the intuition here? What is the idea? So basically here you wanna adapt the step size to take into, to, to, to be sort of like inversely proportional to the norm of the previous gradients. So what is the intuition here? So why do you wanna do that? The intuition is that, uh, so basically you wanna shrink the step size for places where the cost function is sensitive. So basically in places where the cost function is sensitive, this means a high gradient. So the inverse of that gradient, if, if you go, if you pick the step size to be inversely proportional to the gradient, you are actually de decreasing the step size. So, and the idea here is that in places where your function is sensitive, highly sensitive, you wanna actually take smaller steps. So that's the intuition. Uh, right, so again here, uh, let me just like go ahead with the, with the pseudocode, yeah. Let me just, uh, yeah, say a few things about the, the how, how does it, how, what is the idea? So again, you pick, so this is again, you, you start with, a, with, with the SG, with, with the SGD formulation, with the SGD steps. So you pick a sample I uniformly from the training set. So, so, let, so you, you pick a sample I from the training set and then you compute the stochastic gradient with respect to, to that sample. And then again, yeah, so the stochastic gradient is, is indexed by I, so this is the stochastic gradient of sample I at iteration K, G, I, G hat I K. And actually, you wanna, here also you add another term, which is, so you, you add the vector you compute a vector, which is a sum of all the, previous, all the previous gradient norms. So what is the idea? So basically, you can actually create a term here. Uh, I think I need to write something. Right, so actually, yeah. So here again, what, what, what are you trying to do? Here you, 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 have a, you, com, you compute a vector, uik, which has this form, basically. So basically, uik plus one is actually uik, the previous version, plus this GIK, Hadamard product GIK. So basically, first of all, let, let me first unpack what is this one. So what is this, this product? So basically, this is a Hadamard product. So this is an element by element product. So basically, so this product is, has as elements, so this is a vector which has as element the element wide product of these two vectors. So basically, how does this one look like? Uh, okay, so this is actually, I'm gonna take, a, take an arrow here and then I'm gonna, just gonna say what this one means. So basically, if I wanna, uh, if I wanna write out the elements of that vector, uh, let, I'm gonna call this one. So basically, I'm gonna call G. Yeah. Sorry. Yeah, so. So this, this, this Hadamard product between GIK and itself has this, this specific form basically. So here actually you take element by element of, you take element by element product of these two vectors and then you end up with something that looks like that. So basically this is the norm of, yeah. So this is the norm of GI, okay. Sorry, so this is actually so, I, so you take actually, so you, so you take actually, so this is actually, sorry, this notation means here, so this is the first element of that vector. This is the second element, gi2 and gi, so this has size n. Sorry, yeah. So what does this vector has? So basically this is a vector that has the squared norm 
of each gradient vector, of each element of that vector. So basically, this notation, so the parenthesis indicates the, the element within that vector. So basically, so what does it mean? So basically, this is just a vector where actually you have the sums of the square individual element. So this is like taking this uh, element by element uh, square, taking a square and then doing it on an element by element, or a Frobenius norm, or an L2 norm. So this is what this means. And then again, so this UIK, so this is an aggregation. You're adding these terms. So basically what you're doing is that you're summing all these terms. So this is what this UIK is. So basically you sum all these norms of, uh, from, iteration, from iteration one until iteration K. From K equals one to your current iteration. And then again, when you do the weight update actually, so again, let, 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 let me unpack this a bit. So when you do this weight update, you take WK plus one equals WK. So, so far it's similar to, has the same structure, but the descent direction, when you go for, when you compute your direction, so basically you take a square root of that element that you just computed, so this guy, actually the sum of all these guys. You take a square root, again, actually all the elements, all the operations that I have are element by element. So you take a square root, element by element, so you take the square root of each element of that vector. You also invert it, also element by element. So you take an inverse yeah, of each element, and you, 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 you have a Kronecker, you, you have a Kronecker product with GIK. So, what, I mean, what, what is the intuition? What are they trying to do here? And the idea here is like, if I want to write it in a simple way, without, uh, so basically where actually everything W, so every WG are scalars, so in the, like the simple 1D case, this is how it looks like. This is how the update looks like. So, dumb. Okay, uh, and then it's, it's gonna be alpha k. Everything is a scalar here. Right, exactly, so, so in the simple scalar case, this is how it looks like. So you update the weights in the following way, uh, in, su in such a way, sorry. You update the weights in such a way that you're, you scale the step size with the norm of the previous gradients from i equals one to k. So here again, again, the motivation, what is the motivation? Is again, you wanna make the step size be inversely proportional to the gradient. So in places where the gradient is high, the the, the, the cost function is sensitive, so you want to decrease your step size. So this is how it looks like in, in the simple 1D case. But I, I went like, so I, I went with like this, this full notation over, the, over there to have some, uh, some mathematical framework to, uh, to, to talk about that. But this is, this is the intuition. Is it, is it clear? Okay. okay. Uh, uh, right, okay, so as I was saying, so the intuition for using this adaptive gradient, this adagrad method, is clear. So, but however, the problem, there, there is a downside because if, if actually, if you think about this, sorry, let me get back to this one. So if you think about this sort of sum here, you're actually taking the sum of the squared gradients from the first iteration until the last one. Actually, stochastic gradient, sorry, g hat, this is g hat. And then think about, so, so what happens if you have one gradient that is high, a very high norm because your estimator is bad or because the gradient is high, so you have a, you have a steep point and in the, in the, you are at a steep point where the gradient is high. So then this, this, this step size will go to zero, will actually be very small, so then you don't move. So there is a downside basically, so there is a downside. And it actually comes from the fact that this, this sum, when you sum the, the squared gradient, this might blow up because you're summing terms from zero to, uh, to until, the, until one and there's, no, and there's no upper bound. So basically I, an intuitive thing to do, I mean as a, as a signal processing guy, I, I thought this was very nice, very intuitive. So when you have a sum and you wanna like make sure that the sum does not blow out, you just like add exponential weights, exponentially decaying weights. So basically with each iteration, you decrease the weight. So you put, so instead of having equal weights on the sum, you put an exponentially decaying weights. And this is actually exactly the intuition for this RMS prop. So it, this is also another algorithm. So RMS prop is another algorithm where actually it's exactly the same as other grad, except for the fact that you, uh, instead of summing the gradients as they are, as we have there, 
you just add exponentially decaying weights. And if I want to also go very briefly to the, with the formulation, well, actually with the, with the steps, so you, again, it's exactly the same. So you pick an index i at random, you compute the stochastic gradient with respect to sample i, so this is g hat i k. And, uh, and actually, so, uh, and then the update is, it looks exactly the same as Adagret. The, the update for this term, u i k, so this, 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 the sum of the squared norms, looks exactly as this one, right? if you want to compare it, except that you don't have any, any weights. So in, in Adagrad, you, uh, sorry, in, in RMS prop, you take actually a convex combination with, when you update the weight, you take a convex combination between this squared vector and the current one. So basically what happens in this case, so basically beta, remember that beta is a number that is small than one. So basically what you are doing is taking an exponentially decaying weight on, on GIK. So basically this sequence UIK, so this becomes a, an, a, an exponentially weighted sum of these guys. And remember that these guys, this is just a vector that has these squared norms, these squared norms of each entry, where each entry is the squared norm of the individual one. Uh, right, and then again, the update is exactly the same as Adagret, so exactly the same. And remember, all the operators here are element by element. So when you take the square root of that vector, you do that element by element. When you take the inverse, also. And again, here the the main idea is that uh, when when you, when you actually do that uh, exponential decay, so you put actually less weights on the past on on the first sample. So the, the first sample has less weight than the second sample. Second sample less weight than the third one. By doing that, you actually uh, you can actually Im improve the uh, you can actually make it more robust to cases where your gradient may be imperfect and may be too high. So this is as far as RMS prop goes. Okay, so then let me move on to just talk about one more, actually, uh, one more algorithm. And actually this is Adam. This is like the state of the art for training neural networks. So basically this is, uh, this is a state of the art algorithm that is like basically being used in deep learning packages, everything like that. So just to give some intuition actually uh, about the steps, what, what are they trying to do? And again, it, everything is based on SGD, on trying to improve SGD. So SGD is the basic building block. And then we saw like how you can improve with it by adapting the gradient size, by doing this RMS prop, yeah. So, so again, what is, the, what is the intuition with this ADAM? So what are they trying to, to do? Actually, ADAM stands for uh, adaptive moments. So as the name indicates, so the intuition is that you're trying to uh, compensate for the bias on your first and second order estimator. Because actually, because uh, when you're, you, when you, when you, when you use the stochastic gradient as an estimator for your gradient, you have to worry about that the variance, I mean that, the, that it is an unbiased estimator. So basically the mean of the stochastic gradient is the same as the gradient. And you have to worry about the variance being also the same, and also un, uh, being also uh, unbiased. And this is exactly what they're trying to do here. They're trying to create, uh, to add some more terms, some more tricks to SGD in a way to make sure that you try to like reduce the, the bias and the variance. Right, so uh, again, so basically it goes the same as the first couple of steps are the same as SGD. So you, you pick a sample, I, and then you compute this, the stochastic gradient, GI. And then here you actually have, you compute, you first of all compute a bias correction term for the first order moment. And that's the mean of the gradient. So first order moment, this is the mean of the gradient. So you compute a bias correction term for the first order moment. Right, and the, here I have, I have called it UIK. And basically UIK, again, remember that this is a convex combination between the previous iteration and the stochastic gradient that you just computed. So basically, where actually beta one is a parameter that is less than zero. So what, 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 is, what does this mean basically? What is this term? So basically, again, using the same reasoning that we had before, it's clear, it becomes clear that actually this is an exponentially decaying average of the previous as values of GIK. So this is an exponentially decaying average of the sum of the stochastic gradient. So this is the bias, this is the correction, the bias correction for the first order moment. They have the same thing also for the second order moment, the variance. And then it's intuitive to think that because it's a variance, then you actually have the same formulation, but instead of having GI, you have this squared, uh, the, I mean the chronic, uh, sorry, the Hadamard product of these two. And again, so here, uh, 
you also compute a bias correction term for the second order moment. And I have called it VIK plus one. And again, it has the same structure as the other one. So you take a convex combination between VIK, the previous value, and this squared product, which actually has this form. So basically, this is a vector that has the squared entries of each of their individual ones. Right, and then over here, actually, over here, exactly. So you take, uh, sorry, beta two again is a, is, a, is a constant that is strictly less than one. So again, what, what, if you wanna get an intuition about what is happening with this VIK, basically, again, this is an exponentially decaying average of the previous norms of the uh, SGD norms, the norm of the stochastic gradient. So here, it's a running sum where you put, you put less and less weight, exponentially decaying weights, on the norm of each gradient on the squared norm of each gradient. So basically, you can get an intuition that this is, this is, I mean, he, this is, a, this is the mean. You're trying to get something like, that looks like the mean of SGD, and this is something that looks like the variance of SGD. So this is what they're trying to do. And again, finally, there's actually two more. So, so first of all, you have computed the bias, the bias correction term, and then there's a small update for the bias for the first order method, for the first order moment. So basically what you do here is that you just like, you just scale what you have, what, what you have computed. So you, you take the bias correction for the first order moment, you just like divide it by some constant, and then you get like what they call the bias, the updated bias term for the first order moment, this ui hat k, and you do the same for the second order moment. So you update the bias for the second order, which is again, uh, which is basically by, by taking the uh, yeah, sorry, by taking the bias, the, the bias correction term and dividing it. Basically, this is just a scaling version. It, this is just to ensure that these sums converge, actually. That's it. We don't, have to, we don't have to worry about these steps. And then to get the weight update, to get the weight update, it's exactly, it looks similar, in, in, it, it looks in this, it looks similar to, to what we saw previously. So here, what, 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 what do they do? So you take this, you, you take your updated, sorry, you take the update, for the second order moment, the, uh, the bias update for the second order moment, and then you take a square root element by element, you take an inverse also element by element, so one over square root, and you, for this delta is just to ensure that this does not blow up, and then you, you multiply it actually element by element, Hadamard uh, uh, product, by this esti your estimation of the first order method, of the first order bias term, and then that's it. That's it. And again, the intuition here is that by doing this, actually, you are improving your estimation of the bias and of the bias for the first and second order term and gradually reducing that as, as soon as you converge. And again, this is, uh, this is basically more or less, uh, there is, again, there is, no, there is no convergence, there is no guarantees. This is just like intuition. So this is intuition. And then from an, ex an experimental point of view, I mean, this is like has been tried and tested and it beats so many benchmarks. Right, okay, so then let me just like say a few things about the convergence. I wanted to spend more time on this one because I mean, this is a fundamentals course, but I guess we can speed up. So actually, uh, so this is just, just to say, so, so everything that I saw, everything that we saw, there is no, uh, there is no, there is no uh, results that say, okay, this one will converge, this one, no. There is no convergence analysis. So basically, everything that we have, so, uh, so, so back, so back propagation, SGD, the acceleration, momentum, Adam, Adagrad, these are open problems. The convergence of these, the convergence of these methods for, a, for when, you, when you talk about training a deep neural network, this is an open problem also. Because of, as we saw, the non-convexity and some other things that actually I put on the slides. So there's another argument that I put on the slide, but I think there's no, there's no time to go into that now. Okay, and then finally, I also wanna spend like a couple of minutes also saying something about the reg regularization because regularization is, is a very important issue. It's a critical issue in, in deep neural networks. So, uh, right, so basically, uh, as I was saying, it's a, it's a critical issue in deep neural nets. And why, why is it a, a critical issue? Because intuitively, you have a huge number of parameters. So the issue is that in modern neural networks, in modern deep learning, so you have actually networks which have billions of parameters. So when you have billions of parameters, obviously you need to think about overfitting. 
overfitting is a big issue. And uh, so basically, one way to think also about overfitting, I think this was covered in some of the previous slides. So one way to think about overfitting is you're trying to actually reduce the test error at the expense of higher training error. So it's also another way to think. So basically, you're training off the bias for the reduced variance of the estimator. And also another, also another motivation basically is to like think about it, to trying to, uh, so what you try to do is like reduce the model complexity until it makes, a, until it fits the data distribution. That's another way to think about it, yeah. So basically, and again, in deep learning, it's uh, apparently it's quite common to, to start with uh, models that are very complex. So basically you start with an over parameterized system. So a system with too many parameters and you gradually increase your and then you gradually in, in, increase your regularization to reduce the complexity, to reduce the model complexity. Uh, okay, and then also just to say a few things about which types of regularization methods are used. So the most, uh, the most common types of regularization is obviously this L2 norm. So the L2, so the, exactly. So the most common one is the L2 regularization, also called the, the Tikhonov the tick regularization, tick regularization. So basically you just, Take you you take your loss your your loss function f with, and then you add the squared norm. You add alpha plus the norm of w squared, right? In a simple way. And here f tilde w is the regularized function. And if you want to understand pictorially with this like very simple picture, uh, so what is the effect on the solution when you add regularization? I tried to illustrate it here, but I don't know if that's going to be visible. So basically, uh, look at these solid black lines. So this is the cost function f uh, without any regularization, f of w here without regularization. And w star is the solution without regularization. And look at these dashed contour lines as the, uh, as the, as the penalty, alpha w squared. This is the regularization. It actually looks like that because, I mean, it's concentric circles. It's going to be the Hessian. And actually, W tilde is the solution when you actually, when you minimize the regularized function. So basically, you minimize F of W plus uh, alpha W squared. Right, so basically, you can, so basically, you want, you want to compare. So, so this is what happens. W star is what, what, what happens when you have no regularization. And W tilde is the solution with the regularization. So you can see that you have actually pushed, this, pushed the solution closer to the origin. So basically, what does that mean? It means that the norm of the solution with regularization, so W tilde, so the norm of tilde, it's basically this vector, is smaller than W star. Right, so basically by just, by just, by adding this, this regularization factor, you have actually pushed the solution closer here. Because here, this is the point where actually these two, where actually, uh, where, where, where this, I mean, this is the point that kind of like minimizes the sum. So this is the point of equilibrium in this, in this small example. And the idea is that this vector, W star, W tilde, so the one with the regularization, has a smaller magnitude than W star. So by adding this L2 norm penalty, you shrink the solution, make it closer to zero, and ultimately, it has a lower complexity. It has a lower model complexity. Okay, so that's one. And then the, the, the other one, there's another, yeah, so there's another one. It's, there's another sort of regularization. It's all also called the L1 regularization. So basically, what you do here, again, it's, so you take the uh, f of w, and then you add alpha w1, where w1 is the L1 norm of that vector, basically the sum of the absolute values of each entry. And uh, so again, what is, what, what is the effect of this solution? What does it, what does it do? Uh, Again, I've used the same example, right? So this is the same example. So, uh, so you have uh, the dashed, so these black contour lines, this is the function f of w without the regularization. w star is the optimal solution without regularization. And now actually this, the contour lines of this alpha L1, the uh, sorry, alpha w L1, the one norm of alpha w, it actually looks like that because this is an L1 norm actually. So the L1 norm has this like, sort of like rectangular shape or paralloid shape. This is how it looks like. And actually the points where these two lines meet is actually here because, uh, be because of the shape of the L1 norm. So the point where actually these, these two functions, the minimum of the sum of these two functions, it's gonna be here in this example. And actually what happens if you compare W hat, W tilde to W, actually W tilde 
has, it's a vector, but one of the components, so the y-axis is zero. So basically, this is a sparse vector. So sparse, by, by sparse, I mean this is a vector where you have something W tilde. It looks like that. So basically, you have one entry that is zero and the other one that is not zero. So basically, this is what, what you mean. This is the intuition by adding, by adding that L1 norm. So basically, by, because of the shape, so actually, so basically, the solution is either going to be here or going to be here. But in that case, it's going to be here. So basically, you have, what, you have, what, what you have done, what, what you do, what, what, what is, I mean, the effect of this one is to make the solution sparse. So basically, it's also, it's also gives, uh, it's also called sparse regularization as well, yeah. So you just like, you have, you have some components that are zero and some components that, are, that become non-zero. So again, uh, right, so as I was saying, I mean, this falls under the category of like uh, what Jan LeCun calls tricks of the trade. So basically heuristics to improve the training performance, again, without any guarantees. So one of them is batch normalization. I think Hossein talked about it in the previous lecture. And also another set of uh, tricks that they also talk a lot about, they, they, they discuss a lot, is a parameter in, in initialization. And basically what you try to do is you want to initialize, so, so this, is, this is the parameter, in, this is how do you initialize the weights when you start your training. And again, this is a very important issue in the non-convex setting because when you, when you talk about, when you have a, when, in, if, you, if you have a convex function, then it doesn't matter where you start because you're always going to end up at the optimal point if you have a convex function, right, in the convex setting. However, if you think, of, so if you start here or here, but if you're, if you're in the convex setting, right, and this is your globally optimal solution, if you start here, you're gonna stop here if you're using first order methods. But if you start here, you end up at the, at the optimal solution. So that's why this is more critical in that, uh, in that setting. So, uh, so again, this is, also, uh, this is also true when we talk about weight initialization. So they have some heuristics, and again, these are just like, just plain heuristics. So one of them is like, uh, so one of them is weight uh, so one of them is like random in in initialization. Uh, so basically here, you, you, you pick a uniform distribution. Uh, sorry, let me just define some parameters first. So basically, again, recall that W is, so WJ is layer J. So this is the, the matrix which has the weights of layer J. So this is a matrix that has D, D, but this is a matrix of size D by D minus one, sorry, DJ by DJ minus one. So this is layer J. And, uh, and then again, when, when you wanna, so one, one is this like random initialization. Well, what, what do you do, what do they do? Is you pick each element independently from the other elements according to a uniform distribution with that width. So the uniform distribution is like minus one over square root of dj minus one and one over square root of dj, that's it. So you just like pick, so you take every layer, you take every matrix of each layer and then you pick each element independently of the others according to this distribution. Another one is like what they call the, the Xavier initialization, which in which you basically also, you pick the elements, each element independently of all the other ones according to a different distribution in which you take account the, the width and size of each layer. So basically here, you pick a uniform distribution of size dj by dj minus one. And yeah, actually sorry, of size minus six over this one and then plus six over this one. And actually, why six? Yeah, it's, this is experimental, yeah. So why these constant? This is just validated on an empirical point of view. So they just like try this one, so they initialize it, and then try to measure some sort of trade-off between the training performance and the test performance. Yeah, there's another one also called Saxe initialization. You, you, uh, you, you sort of like start with, a, start with a orthogonal matrices. You just start with unitary matrices in that sense. Again, no idea why, but it just works. Uh, yeah, okay, right. Uh, so then I guess at this point, let me stop and just like conclude. Uh, right, so again, uh, here I try to talk about the, some of the challenges in large scale learning, uh, not the, the, the non-convexities of the loss, the, the issue with the number of saddle points, uh, ill and poor conditioning, I also tried to discuss a bit, hopefully it was, uh, it was clear, some of the methods that they use, so uh, going from S S stochastic gradient descent, 
accel uh, sorry, momentum methods or nested of methods, uh, mini batch, uh, mini batch SGD, and then these adaptive rate methods, which are which we have covered: Adagrad, RMS prop, and Adam. And finally, some. Uh, I also talked a bit also about some uh, the role of regularization, and finally we covered just like some heuristics on in initialization. And actually, there's many, many more, other, many other methods for training, actually, which I did not have time to cover. So actually, the most important one is actually this, I, this idea of like dropout training. It, it, it's, a, it's, a very, it, it, it's a completely different method without any, uh, yeah. Okay. Uh, okay, so I'll, I'll stop at this point. I think I, uh, I underestimated the time that I needed. Okay. Questions? Okay. Um, so far, I mean, all this again has like super real values. Um, mm -hmm. The context of this is setup. How is uh, one setup can be uh, like we just decompose into a real, you know, vector. Yeah. Into real parts. Like, but if yeah. you only want to operate in, in one vector, then this would be possible. Actually, as far as I know, I've, I've seen some words that actually approach a problem, like you said. They try to, to decompose the. So yeah, the operation of each layer in by taking, so you have something like uh, y equals ax, where actually a and x are complex in that case, and then they try to actually decompose this into two real parts plus an argument uh, that is replaced with a complex parameter, yeah. But I think it's about, it's about the motivation, yeah. So actually, they, there, is no, uh, there is no motivation for looking at the complex case. Because I mean, well, I mean, little motivation, I would say. Little motivation. At least this part is not clear, because I mean, for for so the reason for like signal processing and uh, c communication guys to look at uh, complex system is that everything uh, they correspond to many real world cases because you have actually the transmission of like electromagnetic waves that has a that needs complex number. You have the transmission of uh, QAM systems of sorry QAM signals that requires that actually is best modeled by complex. Matrices, but on the other hand, when you think about image classification and when you think about some of these tasks, actually digit recognition, uh, th there is no there is no motivation. There is no need for that. This is, I think, my my point of view. Yeah, but I guess I mean in terms of the way they model the problem, I think I've seen a few works that actually do exactly what you said. So they try to actually decompose this into a sum of real part and complex part. Okay. Uh, no question. Um, I can I can mm -hmm. just um, perhaps just comment on, on something. Um, so most of the algorithm that Fadi mentioned, um, it's true that for some of them there is no theoretical guarantee in general, but doesn't mean that we don't know anything about them. So some of them are really. Uh, um, Say, um, somehow developed or, or found really experimentally, but honestly, not all of them. And for some of them that have been developed really experimentally by just some experimentation on the side, and now we have some some uh, very good theorem why they are working or why they should work somehow. But then the thing is that whenever you look mm -hmm. at optimization landscape of um, of neural network, it's just so complex with so many parameters and non-complexity uh, and everything yeah. that it's really hard in general to say something over there about the global optimality, for example. So whenever you say, you really you yeah. somehow end mm -hmm. up to say how, how hard it is to converge yeah. to some stationary point at the end of the day. Uh, but then it doesn't mean that we cannot say something like that. So yeah, we exactly. can say mm -hmm. something like that, we can say, how the geometry looks like around the optimal solution if we use, for example, yeah. another grad algorithm. And then we know why it should work, perhaps, and then why it is like first order approximation of... Um, the exactly, you have an intuitive, space. exactly. I mean, you have a, uh, yeah, you have an intuitive understanding. Yeah. Exactly. So you understand intuitively that like when you shrink this, mm -hmm. you make the step size go inversely proportional to the gradient, then you want to go slower. But on the other hand, it's also important to keep in mind that if you also want to apply that to a neural network, if, to a deep learning problem, if you want to 
so you have a you have a general training problem where you have like lots of weights and then these weights are like maybe matrices maybe vectors in that case actually having this update this idea where you update each weight according to this other grad there is no convergence actually you have you don't know whether this is going to converge actually so this is this is the thing to keep in mind so you can understand intuitively that yes i mean you should you should converge to a point that is more or less stable but when you try to apply that to a new deep neural network where you actually have to do this at a grad because everything we saw so far here actually you are actually doing everything to so when you look at the update the gradient update stochastic gradient update so basically when you do this update wk plus one equals wk plus whatever or minus whatever uh, so here what you are assuming actually is that you're updating all the layers in the network simultaneously but in practice when you do that in, in deep learning this is not the case actually in deep learning actually you actually update each parameter uh, you, you update each parameter separately even in back propagation so basically you do a gradient step for each layer for each weight whereas when you when you talk about the convergence analysis or even when you when you formulate the problem of adagrad and these guys actually you, you actually formulate it in the case of this fully parametric form where you have actually the weights updated where you, you are assuming implicitly that the weights are updated for all the layers yeah so this mismatch also is the reason why that you, the the convergence that you have for these methods in this like where, when you assume this fully parametric form this does not hold when you also apply them to a neural network that's one way to, to think about it also. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you.